So, inshallah, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so just a quick reminder, like we said last week, uh, this event goes on every Monday at 11 a.m. until 11.30. The first 20 minutes are, first 20, 15 minutes will be a quick talk uh, discussing one of the hadith from Ibrahim Nawi, going in chronological order, starting from uh, hadith number 21. Mm -hmm. And inshallah, today we'll go over hadith number 22 and 23. So two hadith for today, inshallah. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma shahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa ahlul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Hadith number 22. An Abi Abdullah, Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari, radiyallahu anhuma, anna rajulan sa'ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqal, ara'ayta idha sallayta al-maktubat, wa sumtu ramadhan, وأحللت الحلال وحرمت الحرام ولم أزد على ذلك شيئا أدخل الجنة قال نعم On the authority of Abu Abdullah Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari رضي الله عنه he said A man questioned the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and said Do you think that if I perform the obligatory prayers fast in Ramadan treat as lawful that which is lawful that which is halal and treat as forbidden that which is haram and do not increase upon that, then shall I enter paradise? He وسلم, said yes. So, starting from the beginning of the hadith, we see that the Sahabi, Jabir radiallahu an, specifically mentions doing salah and fasting in Ramadan. This puts an even more emphasis on us to focus on our prayers and fasting because they're pillars of our deen. So from this, we're reminded of the importance of making sure to pray our five daily prayers and fasting over Ramadan. And these are basic obligatory actions that are required on all of us here. But a lot of the times we see that we, even, that we forget or even downplay the importance of Salah or fasting. For example, as students at UIC on campus, sometimes we'll get busy and sometimes we get caught up with classes or missed prayers, etc. Or for example, when Ramadan comes around, we might not fast on exam days because we might say that, okay, if we fast on an exam day, uh, I won't be able to focus or I won't do as well on the exam if I'm not, if I'm not fasting, or if I am fasting. So these are things which as Muslims, we have to have as our top priority in our lives when it comes to salah and fasting and all our ibadat in general. And we will see in the end of the hadith that this is a matter that is concerning whether we will enter Jannah or Jahannam. So the consequence of us praying or us not praying or of us not fasting is whether we enter Jannah or Jahannam. So nothing is worth risking that after a four. Whether it be uh, missing a lecture, if you miss a lecture or miss an exam, etc. These are all insignificant when it comes to being held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every single little thing we did. That is something that is much more important for us to take care of and to prepare for. And that after is much more heavy than, for example, missing an exam or a lecture. So we have to structure our mind uh, and build our schedules, actually, our daily schedules around our salah and our siyam and our ibadah in general. When we sign up for classes, we have to try to always leave time for Jummah on Fridays. Uh, so, and, and that's the first point that we take from this hadith, right? That, okay, we have to structure our time around these basic obligatory acts, and specifically mentioning siyam and salah. So next, Jabir radiallahu anh, mentions something very important and very, very deep. He concisely summarizes that the lens we have as Muslims, the lens we have to use for our actions as Muslims. And he says, if I treat as lawful that which is halal, and if I treat as unlawful or forbidden that which is haram. And this is a concept that has to be understood from a holistic perspective. As Muslims, we don't just do our daily prayers like, like we talked about. We don't just fast like we talked about in Ramadan, and pray Jumu'ah, etc. But we, we don't just stop there. We continue and we spend our entire lives in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We spend every single second, everything we do as a service for Him, right? So when you understand that, it becomes your measure for action is that which is halal, I do, and that which is haram, I don't do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Dariyat, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I did not create the jinn and, and mankind, mankind except to worship me. So when it comes to anything and everything we do in our lives, it has to be in accordance with the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that is halal, again, we participate in it. Anything that is haram, we stay away from it. 
And we do this understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the best reward for those who do good deeds and stay away from all the bad deeds. And most importantly, remember that this is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ma'idah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَدَ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds that for them there is forgiveness and a great reward. So inshallah, let's do everything we can as Muslims here in America, even surrounded with all the haram that we have in society, try to stick to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try to make that which is halal lawful and try to make that which is haram unlawful. So abstain from bad deeds and enjoy good deeds. Now, moving on to the next point we see in the hadith. Fulfilling the obligatory deeds in Islam is the bare minimum we need to do to enter Jannah. But, of course, as human beings, we're full of mistakes. And we make mistakes and sins all the time. So part of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He has allowed the good deeds that we do to erase the bad deeds. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُدْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ ذَلِكَ ذِكْرَ لِلذَّاكِرِينَ Surely good deeds wipe out evil deeds. That is a, remindful, a reminder for the mindful. And this is a character trait and sign of those who have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says in Surah Al-Mu'minun, أُولَٰئِكَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيَرَاتِ وَهُمْ لَهَا سَابِقُونَ It is they who raise to do good deeds, always taking the lead. So sometimes when people read this hadith, they see that, okay, Jabir radiallahu anhu only asked about the obligatory actions. He asked about the basic basic uh, pillars of Islam when it comes to fasting in Ramadan, and he phrased it in a way that it comes off as very simple. But we have to understand that when it comes to extra acts or recommended acts, which are sunnah, those are things we have to race towards. As we've seen the ayah before, yusari'una bil khayrati. They, they, they rush to do khair. So not, not just pray your five daily prayers and that's it. That you rush to do those, those uh, extra acts, those sunnah, sunnah acts, because they are forgiveness for you when you inevitably will make a mistake. You will, you will uh, sin, you will do mistakes, and for that, you have to erase those bad deeds with good deeds. And if you want this high status and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a reward unlike we can ever imagine, then we have to not only do the bare minimum of the obligatory deeds, but again, do as much as we can from the recommended deeds. And one point I would like to also address in this hadith is that the admit, the, being admitted into paradise is of two types, or two major stages, you could say. Number one, preliminary entrance into paradise without being held accountable or punished for sins perpetrated in this life. So that one is for the ones who their good deeds outweighed their bad deeds, and on the Day of Judgment, they entered into Jannah without any punishment, without any punishment, punishment at all. And the second is admittance into paradise upon receiving recompense for sins perpetrated in this life. So after uh, you see that, you know, for example, on the day of judgment, if your bad deeds were higher than your good deeds, you have to repay off those bad deeds that were higher than your good deeds. And you go into uh, Jahannam uh, and pay for those sins. So of course, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make from those who enter Jannah preliminarily. From the, the, in the first stage where you walk into Jannah and without having paid a single, a single punishment for any of your bad deeds, inshallah. So that should be our goal. And that is all for hadith number 22. Inshallah, again, we're going to go over two hadith today. Hadith number 23. Because the first one was a little bit short and the second one was a little bit longer. So inshallah. Hadith number 23. عن أبي مالك الحارث بن عاصم الأشعري رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الطهور شطر الإيمان والحمد لله تملأ الميزان وسبحان الله والحمد لله تملان أو تملأ ما بين السماء والأرض والصلاة نور والصدقة برهان والصبر ضياء والقرآن حجة لك أو عليك كل الناس يغدو فبائع النفس فمعتقها أو موبقها On the authority of Abu Malik Al-Harith bin Asim Al-Ash'ari رضي الله عنه that he said The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said Purity is half of Iman. Alhamdulillah fills the scales in Subhanallah and Alhamdulillah fills that which is between heaven and earth. In the Salah is a light 
in charity is a proof, in patience is illumination. And the Qur'an is a proof either for you or against you. Every person starts his day as a vendor of his soul, either freeing it or causing it ruin. Starting off with the first statement, purity is half of Iman. This is actually referencing wudu, according to Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali in his explanation of his hadith. He says this meaning is strengthened by another narration that says wudu is half of Iman. So the next thing we'll also see is the meaning behind the term of half of Iman. So you understand that the purity aspect is referring to wudu, according to Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, that's his opinion. And when it comes to the half of Iman, he also says there are two divisions of Iman. The first division purifies the heart and the internal body, and the second division purifies and cleans the external body. So in this regard, both divisions are two equal parts of Iman. So what Ibn Rajab is explaining to us is the meaning behind the statement that purity is half of our Iman. And next, the hadith mentions the virtue and reward for saying Alhamdulillah and SubhanAllah and doing dhikr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in general. And again, these are words that a lot of times we may think are very light on our tongues and they're easy to say. We might think that, okay, it's not a big deal. When really it is heavy, heavy on the scales. And this is the exact, the exact words Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says. He says, it, it fills the scales with good deeds. These small things that we do. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his hadith reminds us of this importance of dhikr. And it really is something that we cannot forget. And although there are many different types of dhikr, uh, I like to focus on one specific type so we can take away that benefit and apply it in our lives, inshaAllah, and that is afkar salawat. So afkar salawat, of course, the dhikr you make after salah, whether it's uh, sunnah or uh, a fard salah you did or jama'ah, for example, whatever salah. Now, this kind of dhikr requires very little of time, right? It just needs a few minutes. And its reward is huge, but a lot of times we rush out after salah without even making the recommended adha. And this is something that is very, very, very important for us to remember. If, if we can just take these couple minutes from our, from our time to sit down after salah and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it, it will fill up your good scales of good deeds on day of judgment. Tamla ul mizan, again, it fills the scales. So this is a reminder for myself first and foremost, and everyone here, that we should try to remember and do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as we can, especially after our salawat. And even if you have to leave immediately, for example, uh, you can of course make the dhikr as you're leaving, if you have to leave. You, you don't have to be sitting down during salah doing dhikr. And next, the hadith mentions that salah is a nur, is a light for us. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and Anas qal, qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, حُبِّبَ إِلَيَّ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا النِّسَاءِ وَالطَّيِّبُ وَجُعْلَ قُرَّةَ عَيْنِ فِي الصَّلَاةِ Anas reported, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Beloved to me in the world are women and perfume, yet the delight of my eyes is prayer. Also, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, An Ubat ibn al-Samit qal, Qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إذا صلى الرجل فأحسن الوضوء وأتم ركوعها وسجودها قالت حفظك الله كما حفظتني وإذا أساء ركوعها ولم يتم ركوعها ولا سجودها قالت ضيعك الله كما ضيعتني وبعد ابن الصامت reported the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said when a man prays performs ablution or wudu correctly and perfects the bowing in prostration the ruku' and sujood the prayer says, May Allah preserve you as you have preserved me. When he performs his bowing properly, his ruku' properly, neither perfecting his bowing nor his prostration, neither perfecting the ruku' or the sujood, the prayer says, May Allah waste you as you have wasted me. And this is the right perspective to have, brothers and sisters. We have to look at our prayers as an opportunity for us to gain good deeds, to fill our scales with hasanat. You have to look at it with this perspective. Because without that, again, the Salah itself will say, may Allah waste you the way you wasted me. You had an opportunity for good and you took it and you threw it out the window. So again, the importance of not just performing Salah, like we talked about before, 
but also perfecting it and doing it to the best of our ability is something we all need to implement in our lives as much as possible, inshallah. And next, the hadith says that sadaqah, giving charity, is a burhan, is a proof for the Muslim. In Arabic, burhan means a, a clear proof, not just any proof, a clear proof. And so giving charity is a proof of the iman of a Muslim. It is proof that you have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you're looking for the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it is something that is not obligatory on us, yet you do it out of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and out of seeking for his mercy. And remember the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ma naqasat sadaqatun min mal. Charity does not decrease wealth. And then the hadith continues and mentions that patience is an illumination. So again, just to main, like, remember that concept. Sadaqah is a charity, is a clear proof for us on a day of judgment that we did something good for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same way, patience, just like that, is an illumination. And this is very important because without having patience, we would deviate off of the path of true submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will test us with many different kinds of tests. And we have to have patience and steadfastness. And without patience and steadfastness, you can't truly, truly continue to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the correct way. Because a lot of times we're living in America, we're living, for example, at UIC. Uh, you're living in a society where you're surrounded 24-7 by haram, 24-7. There's always an opportunity, there's always more opportunities to do the wrong than to do the right. There's more opportunities to do the haram than the halal. So you really have to take an active stance and decide that I will have patience. I will have istiqamah, for example, we talked about last week, the last hadith, istiqamah, steadfastness, that I will stay on this path looking to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have patience when it comes to the bad things that come and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the good deeds that come. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَالْقُرْآنُ حُجَّةٌ لَكَ أَوْ عَلَيْكَ And the Qur'an is a proof either for you or against you. And Allah, brothers and sisters, this is a heavy, heavy, heavy statement. This hadith should make us rethink and reflect on everything we do in our lives. Imagine, on the Day of Judgment, you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the Qur'an you thought you had read to benefit yourself. You thought you read to help you on the Day of Judgment. You thought you read so it would come as a shafa'ah. It would come as an intercession for you on the Day of Judgment. But in reality, it has come for the opposite. It has come for a proof, a proof against you, a hujjah. SubhanAllah, this is why we cannot just read the Qur'an and memorize the Qur'an and not understand it or implement anything in, uh, of it in our lives. We can't look to the Qur'an just for spiritual healing or look at it just as something that it makes me feel good and I don't apply anything in the Qur'an. You have to look at it as both. I look at it as spiritual healing, but as well, it impacts my daily life. And not just my daily life, but every single action I take as a human being. And we have to really look at the Qur'an as the best solution to all of our problems and always look towards the Qur'an as the answer. Umar ibn Khattab says, حَاسِبُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَن تُحَاسِبُوا تُحَاسَبُوا وَزِنُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَن تُوزَنُوا فَإِنَّهُ أَهْوَنُ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الْحِسَابِ غَدًا أَن تُحَاسِبُوا أَنفُسَكُمُ الْيَوْمِ Hold yourselves accountable before you are held accountable and evaluate yourselves before you are evaluated. For the reckoning will be easier upon you tomorrow if you hold yourself accountable today. So make sure we all take this time to really deeply think and contemplate. Am I among those who read the Quran but have no care whatsoever for what's in it? Do I care to apply what's in the Quran? Or do I just recite it because it sounds nice? Or I recite it when it comes to the imp but when it comes to the impact, I recite it with no understanding to the meaning and no care for the meaning. And again, of course, not every single one of us. Myself, for example, I can't open up the Quran and understand 100% of what's being said in the Quran. But you take the time to learn. You put the effort in to learn. So it's the attitude that's important for us. It's the attitude. We don't just read the Quran as something that sounds nice and makes us feel good. But we read it as something that truly we believe is a guiding light for us in this life. Now, and again, this is a reminder for myself before everyone else. Lastly, the hadith says, كُلُّ النَّاسِ يَغْدُوا فَبَائِعُ النَّفْسَةِ فَمُعْتِقُهَا أَوْ مُوبِقُهَا Every person starts his day as a vendor of his soul, either freeing it or causing it ruin. Now this is pointing towards a very, very important issue. 
which is how to free ourselves from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith states that everyone who goes out in the morning and sells himself, everyone goes out in the morning and sells himself either for good or for bad. And every morning we sell ourselves either by freeing ourselves from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or leading ourselves into the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore destroying ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Successful indeed, successful indeed is the one who purifies their soul, and doomed is the one who corrupts it. Brothers and sisters, the person who struggles to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obeys Him subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who frees himself, the person who has istiqama, the person who has patience, the person who gives charity, the person who fasts and prays and does adhkar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the person who's purified their soul and they have won. Every morning, every morning when we leave our houses on our way to UIC, we are either gaining rewards and thereby winning, or we're gaining sins and thereby losing. So let's not indulge in sins and destroy ourselves like we see in this ayah. If we work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obey Him, then inshallah we are winners. But if we violate the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and disobey Him, then wallahi we will gain nothing. And but, but loss after loss in this dunya and in the akhirah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes who the loser will be on, on, on the day of judgment in Surah Zumur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَعْبُدُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ مِن دُونِهِ قُلْ إِنَّ الْخَاسِينَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَهْلِيهِمْ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ أَلَا ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْخُسْرَانُ لِبْنُ مُبِينَ Worship then whatever gods you want instead of him. Say the true losers are those who lose themselves and their families on the day of judgment. That is indeed the clearest loss. أَلَا ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْخُسْرَانُ الْمُبِينَ The mubin, the clear, clear loss. So inshallah, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us on the straight path in worshiping him alone. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from his righteous servants who remember him often. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the Qur'an a hujjah for us on day judgment and not against us, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.